The other thing that frustrates me is people who have experienced poverty, who have gotten the straps for their bootstraps, <laughs> who sit and talk about how we shouldn't do anything for the next person. Oh. The hearing will come to order. Good morning and welcome to the Budget Committee's hearing on Poverty in America, Economic Realities of Struggling Family. We need to hear from our witnesses as to how public policy affects them. People are afraid to talk to poor people who will challenge the system. <laughs> they would rather talk to poor people who say, everything's just fine, we just work hard. That is not true. We're not talking about working hard, living wages. When, we're saying folk ought to have a living wage if they work hard. They ought to have health care. Somebody has to stand up to the lies. I've heard so many distortions in the day, it actually hurts my head. I mean, to suggest that, that work, th th these people who work hard, we all have to tell our stories and our children, but to somebody to say, well, Je Jesus never said anything about Caesar. First of all, it's interesting that you all would define yourself as Caesar. Are there examples of successful anti-poverty programs that you have been a part of that address these pro problems for you? Thank you. Uh uh, Member Flores, yeah, and and that's I'm, I'm hearing everybody testify as well over the same thing, and I'm finding it hard to understand why, when the word is said hard work, why is that interpreted in a different way? I realize all of us sitting here, everyone in this room, has worked hard to some extent, but what we're saying is, and, and I believe you all would agree, that even where you all sit as representative Congress and senators, you did not do it by not working hard. And so we just need to understand what that word means. We're saying that you have to persevere, you have to endeavor. And for me, I grew up in the same environments that everyone sitting here is testifying about. Again, my mother was on drugs, in and out of prison. My grandmother did not have federal aid. My grandmother bought a house in 1972, working as a janitor at Louisiana State University. So before the civil rights, there was no federal aid. There was no welfare and food stamp. So I'm sorry if I come from an environment where I have seen that you do not have to rely on government. Right. You can work hard and persevere no matter how long it takes. And that's what I did. In a society where our first constitutional duty is to establish justice, and promote the general welfare, the general welfare. I got the food stamps for a couple years, so I'm not, I'm not here to say totally dissolve it. People do need help, but what I'm here to say, and especially working in the real estate in industry, it doesn't have to be perpetual. Right. You know, you got families that pass Section 8 and welfare down like it's an inheritance. The Bible says we ought to lay up an inheritance for our children, sure, and it's not government entitlement. What, what should our approach be to anti-poverty programs? Empowerment is the, is the key. You know, empowering a, a single father, empower a single mother to get back on her feet to where she can do so in a way that builds dignity uh, and not dependence. Um, to answer the other question, I would say the churches, in my opinion, have been probably some of the strongest organizations to deal with these issues. Um, in my personal life, it was the church. It was the, they got me involved in homeschooling when everybody thought we was crazy. They got me involved uh, in even opportunities for employment and things like that. And so that would be the number one uh, organization, I would say, that we, we, we would need to empower a little bit more uh, with the TANF and things like that. But again, can they do so and, and still be able to preach Christ and to have the same right. worldview and positions that, that basically made them conspicuous to the government in the first place? Right. Man, wow, you guys are doing an amazing job, but then when I give you money, shh, yeah. you know, we don't wanna, we don't wanna talk about what made you so successful. Talk about the systematic barriers that exist in creating prosperity and what it means for us to remove those so that all of us could have the prosperity that is guaranteed within our constitution. Corporate interests have sent their representatives here to preach personal responsibility and the danger of government intervention, but the truth is we must take a collective responsibility for the inequality, the unjust laws and systems created. God did not make us poor. When you, when you, you said you homeschooled your kids, and I want to understand what values you teach them. 
Well, I definitely teach them personal responsibility. And even to add to that, what you say about trade, me and my husband both, even though I have a bachelor's degree, I also have a trade. My husband is a barber. He has a trade. We have lived the life they're saying with the living wages. I bought a house making $4.25 an hour. So we understand living on wages. But the way we got out of poverty is what you're saying is we got trade. We went and got an education. And my, me and my husband talk about that all the time. If the government could make trade more accessible, you know, spend those federal dollars so people can sharpen their skills and get out. My husband just bought us a three-bedroom home, two full bath home in Chicago, being a barber with a trade. He has a 10th grade education, and he did it with a trade skill. So those are the kind of programs that we should be advocating for our government to sharpen our skills, bring back those trade skills into the black community so that we can rise above poverty. We can't do it with just a high school education all the time. We need trade, we need skills. Folks have the ability to transition off of the helping hand into an entry level job that quickly accelerates into a middle class job that can quickly accelerate into a career. You don't believe they should start with a living wage? Uh, you know, it's according to what the person is. If it's a person that's got kids. They're human being. They're created by God. They shouldn't start with a living well, wage if they're working 40 hours a week. If they're 16 years old living at home, that I'm might be about different. If they're, if they're 16, or, or 18, or 19, or 20, shouldn't they have a living wage? Sure. A living if, wage. If they're living by themselves and they're, and they're yeah, I mean, I, I worked my They should have a living wage if they got two people in the house, but they should have a living wage if they... Well, again, we have to look at what the numbers. You've got stats. I want to look at the facts as well. I mean, again, I, I hope well, we can. I, I really want to talk to you. I believe that down in there, there's a heart somewhere. Mm -hmm. I want to get with you, brother. <laughs> I want to get with you. How important are these community and faith-based organizations in helping combat poverty? Anybody in this room that has been a part of a program, a uh, government program, whether it's a government school, whether it's a government uh, housing program, whether it's a government food program, um, we've been disingenuous if we lift those programs up like, like they're blessings all the time. There's a lot of churches that don't want to be involved in government stuff just because it smells like government. It's like, we're just gonna throw money at this thing regardless of the values just being, you know, you guys said that there's values behind, behind budgets, but there's also values behind programs. And uh, a lot of times they don't want to engage because of the values that come behind the money. It's like a Trojan horse. Yes, we're going to bless you with money and housing, but yet we're going to give you all of these values that are against what we believe and how we raise our families. And so you have to engage the churches uh, and really all faith communities. You have to engage them on how to reach their own people, uh, I think would be, would be a huge step forward. We came here to have a real conversation. We didn't come here to talk this mythology and foolishness about, um, uh, you know, I grew up in poverty and therefore I've just worked hard and got, that's not what we came here talking no. about. We have a budget. If you, talk, you got your budget, hold it up, Liz. I want the nation, I'm gonna speak to America now. We want, I want to see the front of your, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. We talk all day long about love and heart, where your treasure is, where your heart <laughs> is. We came here with a plan, not just with partisan mythology. We came here with a plan to challenge both Democrats and Republicans, but it seems like one side we really got to challenge, but we're gonna work on everybody. How important are volunteers to your community and, and the service you're trying to provide? Yeah, in our community, we just, the mayor just gathered all the churches together, it's 20 some pastors, and he said, if anything goes wrong in this city, everybody knows that it's gonna be you all that does the brunt of the work of fixing and getting people out of this, this crisis. And so, yeah, the church is, is, is critical in putting their hands to the plow, training um, the churches to, to get engaged with the schools, training the churches to get engaged at the governmental levels, the school board levels. Um, these are critical pieces uh, because, again, they, they don't know about what's going on in this room. All they know is, is that we care about people, but we're not going to care about people and sacrifice our values because the government says that we need to because we, we won't get the money. The other thing that frustrates me is people who have experienced poverty, who have gotten the straps for their bootstraps, <laughs> who sit and talk about how we shouldn't do anything for the next person. Oh, 